The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality but little by little he looks at his watch but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall Herd behavior is a fundamental aspect of capitalism and it's something which is left out of conventional economic theory because they don't believe we're herds. We believe we're all individuals and make rational decisions and, and, and therefore we don't have any crises in the future. The reality is we do have herd behavior and people will follow the herd and for a while when you're following the herd, you can make money when the system is going up. The trouble is any herd crashes over the edge of a cliff at some point and it's a person who's aware that that's going to happen and doesn't join the herd when it's getting close to the cliff. They're the ones who survive. Contrary to herd wisdom, financial crises are not unpredictable black swan events. In 2005, Steve Keen was one of the few economists in the world who accurately predicted the US housing market crash and the global financial crisis. What was he looking at that mainstream economists ignore? Private debt. Private debt bubble caused the boom beforehand. Bursting of that bubble caused the downturn. And that driving, rising level of private debt itself is what caused the increase in stock prices. And the crash in the, in, in, in the rate of growth of debt is what's caused the plunge in stock prices. So they think they can create bubbles without using more debt to do it. Well, they can't. So their recipe for getting us out of the crisis is to add to the debt that caused the crisis in the first place. But the great dilemma for this particular delusion is that it's starting from a level of debt which is only slightly down from the levels we reached in 2009, 2010, which are the highest in recorded history. Over the last six years, global bank credit has increased by 40% to just under $100 trillion. In the developed world, private sector deleveraging has been offset by the largest government stimulus since the Second World War. This one-time event has created a rapid recovery in both corporate profits and asset prices. Yet the experts in economics, asset management and policy celebrate as if the problems that led to the financial crisis have been solved. In fact, 2008 was just the beginning. Humanity has to rely upon experts because experts are necessary in a complex society where the technology is complex, uh, where the problems we face are complex. And it's generally speaking, if you rely upon a doctor to, to tell you whether you need an operation or not, or an engineer to say whether your walls have got sufficient stress to withstand earthquake shock, you are relying upon experts who know what they're talking about. But in economics, we're relying upon experts who don't know what they're talking about. Now, if you look at mainstream economics, there are three things you will not find in a mainstream economic model. Those three things are banks, debt, and money and how anybody thinks they can analyse capitalism while leaving out banks, debt and money is a bit to me like the ornithologist trying to work out how a bird flies by, while ignoring that the bird has wings. Today, there are $223 trillion in financial assets, which is three times global GDP. The last time this ratio reached these levels was during the Great Depression. If incomes do not grow, then more debt is the only way to boost spending. This policy of extend and pretend does nothing to fix the underlying problem because the new money does not end up with those most likely to consume. Instead, it remains stuck in pools of capital chasing declining yields. For as long as this continues, the debt ratio and systemic instability will continue to rise. This is known as the Minsky cycle. Only rebalancing through debt forgiveness or default will restore the system. The problem we face is that right up until the cycle's turning point, the opposite appears true, that things are becoming ever more stable. Because people actually want to hear good news about the economy, these people have a Panglossian view of how the economy operates. They're always going to think next year is going to be better than this year. They're always going to tell you that they're not going to have a slump, there's going to be a boom. 
always going to see the positives. That Panglossian stuff is what people want to read in the newspapers. Normally we say bad news sells, but the reality is in finance that good news sells. You can't get a bad news story in. Now the trouble is that that combination of vanity of the academics on the one side, so you've got to publish within the conventional box, and the positive sound bites you want to give to the media, because the media wants good news about the economy, leaves out what's happening in the real world. And ultimately the real world takes its revenge on both. The reality is that by saving the patient, we have also saved the disease. Today, the financial sector is even larger and far more concentrated than it was prior to the crisis. Yet investors continue to bet that quantitative easing can eliminate systemic risk while policymakers hope that austerity measures can and will create growth. The conventional way of thinking about finance is that finance is another profit centre in capitalism. You've got the industrial sector which is profits, service profits, finance profits. Finance fundamentally is not a profit centre, it's a cost of doing business. And if that cost gets too high, then you actually weaken the remainder of the economy, you don't strengthen it. So what you get is the risk of capitalism is being posed upon the workers, when the essence of capitalism is to be the capitalists are the risk takers. Now the trouble is capitalists are risk takers, but the financial sector is behaving like a parasite and dumping its failures upon the future incomes and retirements of working Americans. Contrary to popular belief, there are no black swans. There are just people who ignore the lessons of history. Today, the key to survival is studying history and ignoring the herd. While the herd waits for data points, the smart money has resisted, knowing that the only thing data points indicate are the most recent trends. When we do look to history, we see that only those who've maintained their individuality in the face of mania are the ones who stand to make the biggest gains when the herd finally turns. Institutional investors know that the most dangerous thing they can do is lose their customers' money. You can, the, the, the seduction of a bubble is that institutional investors believe they can make more money for their customers than everybody else does. And then we get that extrapolated takeoff which led, leads to a crash like we saw in 2007, 2008. That's likely to be the indefinite future. So long as we're trying not to admit we borrowed too much money and not to admit we got it wrong economically, we're going to continue going through booms and busts for as long as Japan's been doing the same thing. So the, the best thing institutional investors can do in that situation is realise the danger of losing their clients' money and insure themselves against it to genuinely hedge.